Hi, everyone. Welcome. Thank you for joining us tonight for SD Media Pro's Meeting 2 via Zoom technology. Uh, we met via Zoom last month and had a really great event. And so thanks for being here again tonight. Um, we have a very timely topic. We have Chris and Krista Francis here with us. They live here in San Diego, and when they were both diagnosed with COVID-19, they did what any good filmmaker would do, and started to document their experiences. Um, they grabbed a camera, first the iPhone, which is what they had easily available, and then later their professional equipment. But we're gonna get to hear all the details of their story, their personal story with the illness, their documentation, and how it's all coming together in a documentary called Making Lemonade. So I think that's gonna be fabulous. It's especially timely. And I, I, I think on a number of levels, just because we get to hear about the making of a documentary while you're actually yourself going through an unprecedented experience. So thank you, Chris and Krista Francis for being here tonight. Um, after the presentation, we will be doing a, hello, there you are. <laughs> after the presentation, we will be doing a Q&A. So if you've got questions for Chris and Krista, just go ahead and drop those into the chat, which is down at the bottom of the window. And David Rains and um, Robin Martin will be monitoring that. Robin for technical um, questions and David Rains for content questions as we get to the end of the meeting. Uh, and as always, Tom Kinneman is our technical director tonight, and I'd also want to acknowledge the other members of our board. Um, everybody is so busy, and these are the people who dedicate their time to put together these meetings. And I don't want to forget anybody, so I wrote everybody's name down. It uh, includes Jeff Trover, Kevin Marty, Keith Methvin, Christine Gatlin, and Rich Harville. And of course, Mark Masonov, who normally does our News You Can Use segment, and he is not here tonight unexpectedly. So we're gonna postpone those topics until next month. And uh, he had some interesting information, so it'll be interesting to, to hear from Mark uh, when he's able to join us next. So, um, but again, put your questions into the chat so that we can keep track of those. And also, as Robin mentioned briefly, we'd love to kind of find out what's on your mind when it comes to getting back to work or just the industry in general, once we're done with our conversation about making lemonade. So, but let's start. Let's get started with Chris and Krista Francis uh, by playing the trailer for their uh, documentary, Making Lemonade. All righty then, let me share my screen and this will get us started. Welcome to another episode of Can Krista Taste This? First up, the onion. Nope. It was a Friday night. We had just sat down for dinner, and then I remember thinking, I can't taste my food. NBC 7's Joe Little introduces us tonight to a local filmmaker who is giving us a truly inside look at the virus because he and his wife both got it. So, this is the swab that goes back. We have no idea what this virus is going to do to us. I haven't been able to taste my food in 45 days and I don't know if it's coming back. <laughs> this hasn't been easy, but is it possible that something good could actually come out of it? So I'm going to ask you a favor. Sure. To talk to you about something. Okay. We're gonna stop at a hospital. We got called to do blood draw for further development of the serology tests. By volunteering, you've actually helped us develop what we think is really the best serology test out there. COVID-19 has not been the funnest thing in the world, but, uh, you know, when life gives you limits. I purposely 
purposely waited to see the trailer until tonight. I haven't watched it in its entirety. And I want to know, let you know that it gave me goosebumps. Like I'm very, very interested to hear about the process, to hear about your story. And uh, with that, Chris and Krista, tell us about making lemonade. All right, well, where to begin? <laughs> Um, let's, I think what we'll do, we'll focus most of tonight on the production side of things and how we handled it, but maybe Krista can start off with just a little bit of our health journey that actually started this whole thing. Uh, yeah. So I think the biggest question is, um, who gave it to who? Because with this, you know, we don't really know. Um, Chris had kind of been feeling run down. He had been on a few, uh, production shoots, long days and it started just feeling really run down, maybe a sinus infection. Like many of you guys probably right when the pandemic hit and there were rumors of lockdown, uh, your clients probably did what my clients did, which is one of two things, canceled everything or canceled everything. And then, oh crap, actually, can we get this one last shoot in real quick before we can't do it and it's illegal? And then, oh no, we're going to cancel it. Oh wait, it's back on. So my last week before the pandemic was pretty crazy. I, I ended up doing two video shoots that really wore me down. But I think just the stress of that week of the sprint, stop, sprint, stop, just really wore me down. And I'm, I'm somebody that can get. He's a bit of a, a hypochondriac, if you will, any smallest thing like, and I, okay, I'm just going to use this word man cold. I'm, I'm sure you all know what I mean when I say that. So when he was getting I was like, haters on public. <laughs> I mean, we're live. And so, at least that's kind of initially what we thought. Well, then um, a few days uh, after lockdown, I guess is when it started. I had been, I work a full time job, an office job, and had been in the office on the final day that we could, and then kind of like ran my last minute errands, my last trip to the grocery store. I had a few things. And um, a few days after that, I started feeling like, do I have a little tightness in my chest? Like, am I noticing that I'm breathing when normally you don't notice when you're breathing? Um, and then I thought, I'm being paranoid. And a couple days later, uh, we, had, we were running out. We went to like a drive through coffee store and I had to run to the pharmacy. And as I walked outside, I said, does the air smell bad to you? And to which I replied, I have no idea because I'm so stuffed up. I can't smell a thing. And I was like, it, it smells like poop. Like I literally feel like a dog. Like it's just, it smells bad. I was like, that's so weird. And got in the car, whatever, go, I go to the pharmacy. And when I come out, I smell it again. And I'm like, that's so strange. Like it's not on my shoes. I didn't smell it in the store. I just feel like the air smells bad. Like, well, whatever. Like my smells just maybe off or something. Didn't think anything of it until we're sitting down to dinner that night. And as we're eating, I realized that I can't taste my food at all. I can tell it's spicy, but there's no flavor whatsoever. And over those next couple of days, cause I didn't have a headache. I didn't have, I wasn't stuffed up sinus, anything like you. And so I started to just, I started Googling symptoms. And then on Sunday Which we went for a walk. Which is kind of a dangerous thing yes. to do. WebMD scares the crap out of you. It's true. All the time. It's like I either have COVID or, or you're going to die in two days. And yeah. And so we're on a walk together on Sunday. And I was like, Chris, I, I think I have it. I think, I think the Rona got me. And I uh, ended up setting up a video call with my doctor uh, that night, actually, and told her my symptoms of just pretty much just sudden loss of taste and smell. And um, they got me in to schedule me for a, for a test that next day. And then when my test came back positive, they're like, you should pretty much assume your husband has it. But since Chris's job relies on being around people, at that point, I was working from home full time. But we're like, we need to find out from him because you need to be around people to right, do your right. job. Yeah. So basically, because I had kind of had cold-like symptoms, I started self-isolating early just in case. So I had to pass on a couple of video gigs. Uh, just because I had this cough and wasn't feeling well. And it was like, statistically, I was like, what are the odds that I actually have COVID? That's got to be like next to nothing. Um, but I was like, I can't be the guy that's showing up on set right now coughing. That would be like <laughs> the worst thing I could probably do. Yeah. Um, so I had been self-isolating. So I had literally been sitting on the couch that is right 
here doing nothing for two weeks. Um, and then when Krista thought that she had COVID, my filmmaker instincts was like, wow, this has got to be like one of the first cases of anybody we know. And I have nothing to do. I would like to film this. Um, but then I didn't know, because there's so many dang unknowns about this whole virus. And because we got it pretty early. This was the end of March. Yeah, so it was like two months and ago. And so there was still, I mean, just think of how much information is still changing every day. So go back two months when there's much less information, the fear, and it's just like, there's just so much of yeah. that. Yeah, so Krista, as you'll learn in the film, if you see the whole thing, is a thousand times tougher than I am uh, as a human being. <laughs> so... I had a feeling she would take it well, but I was like, who knows if this crazy virus is like, I don't know, gonna kill her or something. We didn't think it was gonna really kill her, but yeah. I was like, I don't wanna be that husband that's like just sticking a camera in her face instead of like being there and supporting her. So uh, I went with her for the testing because I was like, I wanna see what this looks like. And I haven't been out of the house in two weeks. So this was like the most entertainment I'd had in a while. So I went with her, wanted to film it the whole time. I was like, oh, I just want to film this, but I didn't. Um, and then when Krista got her results a couple days later and they said she was positive, uh, the doctor said, we should assume that you have it as well. And so that's when I was like, all right, it's on. If uh, It's one thing if my wife has it and I'm going to be a supportive husband, but if it's coming after me, I'm at least getting a video of a doctor jamming a pipe cleaner up my nose out of this whole deal. Um, so... I talked to Krista and I, I feel like it took a little, what was your perspective when I said I wanted to start filming? Well, it was interesting because again, this was all very early on and I had been, so my positive result came um, just a, a, a week plus after my last day in the office. And so I had to let HR know that I had come down with COVID and they had to let my entire office know. They kept my name confidential, but we have a, less than a hundred people in our office. I'm actually the office manager. So I'm, I sit at the reception desk. Everyone knows me. I talk to everyone. And so I really went through this emotional journey of like, people are going to find out it's me, like the stigma of like what people, how they'd react to me or feeling guilty, like I'd done something wrong. And so in the beginning, when he's saying, when you're like, I want to film this, I'm like, no, like people are going to find out it's me. Like, I don't want to. And so I kind of had to go through a personal journey, realizing one, the virus like doesn't discriminate against anyone. Like anyone can get it. It's no one's fault that they got it. You know, it wasn't like I was licking doorknobs and whatever. I was following all the necessary precautions. Were you doing? No, okay. no door, no doorknob right. licking. Um, so I eventually emotionally came around to the filming aspect and was like, honestly, he needs something to do because when you're, when you're bored and not working, then that, that's a whole nother thing. So that's true. Krista was making, making all the money and bringing home the benefits. So yep. uh, like most uh, filmmakers, my spouse does all the real work. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, so like, so that happened. And then here, here's my secret. The whole time in the back of my mind, I was like, I'm for sure making a documentary out of this. I was like, I'm going to be the first person to make a legit documentary. This is going to be awesome. Well, the film part of it, obviously. Um, but I sold it to Krista as, I just want to start filming. I just kind of want to start capturing things. I think the appointments would be interesting, the tests. I just want to start filming things. You can say at any time, like, I was like, we're not committing, me filming is not committing to us, like releasing this. I just want to film this, but let's face it. I knew I was going to make a film the whole time. And if it, if it took some convincing, some arguing, I was ready for it, but I was like, oh, I'll just see if I can get her on board by just, just filming. And then I think at some point you well, probably just gave up, right? Of you filming it? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know. I think I kind of forgot that you had told me I could quit at any point. <laughs> All right, let's, can we scratch that from the record? <laughs> can we cut the zoom? Yeah, so anyways, we, we started filming, but here's, here's the dilemma as a filmmaker. Um, so I've got an office. I work out of a, a studio, like a white psych soundstage in San Diego, and that's where my office is, and that's where all my gear was. Um, so we were caught into this. It was kind of this weird thing. So during lockdown, it's like self-isolate, stay home, only go out when necessary. 
and that's what we were doing. But then as soon as we found out that we actually had the virus, then it was like, it literally felt like we may have, we may have gotten into a little bit of an argument once or twice. Cause I kind of became like, we can't touch anything or our neighbors are going to drop over and die right on the spot. Cause we, we do have some neighbors in our apartment complex that are like smokers, older, High at risk, risk, risk health sure. issues. Yeah. So we were like, pretty much trapped. So I was like, I can't go get my gear, even though the office is closed. So for the first probably two weeks, all we had was our iPhones. And I was really happy that I think in February, we up, we upgraded our iPhones. Oh, uh, well, actually, we upgraded Krista's iPhone earlier. Um, do you want to just give them a short story of why we had to upgrade uh, your iPhone? I was on a roller coaster at Disneyland. And on the first hill, it uh, as I'm going down the hill, I watched my iPhone fall out of the pocket from the highest peak of California screaming and it yeah anyways yeah. so she got she needed a new phone and I was like you're getting an 11 pro because I want that camera true story um and then I upgraded in February so I was really glad that I did so the first two weeks was all iPhone nothing else um and I'll actually show you I, I got a little uh sizzle reel this is going to melt your socks off because this is this is a sizzle reel iPhone footage. I don't know if you were planning on watching that tonight. Um, some of these are some extended share takes here. Oh, I got to share my screen. Sorry. Yeah. I did great during rehearsals, but let's see. iPhone reel. I'm probably going to upload this to Vimeo afterwards and see if I can land a bunch of gigs with this, this hot steaming iPhone footage. So we basically just popped this thing into 4K 24P mode. And uh, what was really nice is the image stabilization is pretty dang good. And I'll admit after two weeks of just using an iPhone, I kind of got spoiled. I was like, I like that it does auto everything. Auto focus, auto exposure, auto image stabilization. What it doesn't auto do is set it to HD 24P though, because every time I went to take of video. Make sure you change it to HD 24p. 4K, yeah. Or 4K. Sorry. See, I'm yeah. why I'm not the number one cinematographer right here. Yes. Yeah. So 4K. we used it. We used it for everything. Travel cam, like right here. I did a three camera interview. The third camera is Krista, literally sitting on a bar stool, holding her phone for 40 minutes while I interview an expert on Zoom because I just had to have that third angle. Um, and then we kind of needed it out of necessity. We did. Um, a lot of medical tests. As soon as we got diagnosed, we suddenly became very popular in the medical community. We were getting phone calls and emails left and right, and we wanted to volunteer as much as possible. Um, so we couldn't come rolling in the hospital unannounced with my cinema package. So iPhones worked. And then as you're seeing here, there were lots of, uh, lots of phone calls. Basically, anytime the phone rang, I was like, grab a camera, grab a phone, record this conversation. This could be the doctor giving us key results that we need for the film. Because of course, at this point, I'm thinking about the film. I'm not thinking about our health. Um, yeah, there was times I just wanted to make a phone call and it would take 10 minutes to get the lighting right before I could actually make the call. This is true. We've, we've, we've had like a pretty, uh, we've had a very peaceable marriage, I would say. And even during quarantine, I feel like things have been pretty peaceable. But I think most of our arguments have been Krista wanting to just do something and me saying, no, hold on. I got to get my light. I got to get my camera. I got to get my microphone. Wait, we've already seen you at the kitchen table too much in this film. Can we put you in the blue chair by the window? Can you change your shirt? I think we need a different color. And yeah, that's true. She's been incredibly patient. I don't know how she does it. Cause I'm, I'm editing the film and I'm watching this footage and I'm like, that was me. I would have just slapped me and said, I'm, I'm done with the project so many times. So, um, so yeah, so we started, we started out all iPhone that worked pretty good. And I think given the circumstances, it felt like we had a, like a pass because it's like, what are you going to do? It's quarantine, social distancing. You can't even have a camera crew if you wanted one. So iPhone is what it is. So we just tried to embrace it as our only tool and make that part of the story too, because that's real life. That's how it was yeah. back in those days, a few months ago. So um, I'll start talking more about production stuff because this might be it's really what they care people. about. Yeah. Um, we can do marriage counseling later. <laughs> um, so basically what we did, we just iPhone for two weeks. And then I had my friends literally 
to start dropping off my gear like it was a drug deal like like no joke the the, the first time i got all my gear we were sitting at this table getting blood testing done there was like yep. a clinic that sent a guy out and as i'm literally well this was another thing today but um i'm literally like have a needle in my arm and my buddy's like hey i'm here with the gear so this is how we would do it uh because we had the virus at the time so we we're like we can't infect anybody so my suv is parked right out here i would literally hit the remote keyless remote and pop the trunk and they would just leave stuff in there close it drive off and like send me a text and say hey i dropped off the stuff it's done yeah <laughs> and then i would literally go back out there like 30 minutes later open up my truck and be like what did they bring me today i'm like all right we got a c200 uh we got actually instead of just talking about it let's show you because you know i got another reel for that and i'm gonna hit share screen share yep. this time all right ladies and gentlemen i like to call this one Oh, iPhone out of necessity. Gosh, sorry, this is embarrassing. This is my wife's computer, which is oddly way better than mine. Here we go. Gear arrives. Okay, yeah, so this is basically what it looked like. And of course I had to film it because I might need that footage for the film. So this is literally like my computer, my light, my tripod, my mic, basically like all the basics that I could get in our apartment suddenly turned into his office and storage unit. I'm, let's be honest, I'm really ready to get all of his video gear back in the office and out of our 600 square foot one bedroom apartment. Yeah, there's, yeah, one bedroom apartment gets a lot smaller when it's got a double as a production stage. So yeah, so that's one of my friends, Rico. He's one of my great friends. Um, he was just dropping off gear, socially distancing, of course, and this was before you had to wear masks, so don't, don't judge Rico. <laughs> um, and that's my Drobo. That's my 50 terabyte video server that once I plugged it in, one of the drives failed, so that was kind of fun. Um, so that's, uh, if you know Drobo, I see somebody nodding their head. Uh, that's pretty par for the course. So luckily, I had a four terabyte solid state Samsung drive, so I've been editing the whole, uh, the whole production on that. And this is a, a tour of our production uh, workspace, which when you have a doctor coming over to uh, take some blood from you, you have to then turn your editing bay back into a sterile uh, medical environment. So that's, uh, you know, that's always fun when you're in the middle of it. So, and this is just a shot of some of the gear, kind of my um, main setup. Basically, that's what I had. It wasn't ideal, but it's the Canon C200, just handheld. I had the Rode video mic on the side, which is not that great of a mic, but it was way better than the iPhone. And then I got the small HD focus, the, the OLED version, which is so much better than the LCD version. LCD version is garbage, I wouldn't use it. Um, although it does help you see it in the daylight. Um, that's our little gear corner, which has grown considerably. Uh, Only you then. could see it now. <laughs> I might have scraped up the paint in the walls in the corner there. But uh, our main key light that I had to work with was the new Aperture 300D Mark II. I've got the mini dome on there. I've got my buddy's Rode NTG mic. I have no clue what model that is. Um, we decided to do an Instagram Live one night uh, for a date night because we hadn't been out um, in the world in what seemed like forever. And we had a lot of friends and family with questions. So uh, this is kind of what this looks like through the ProMist filter on there, just to smooth things out, you know. Um, I've got some before and after. The next couple shots are gonna kind of be behind the scenes and then after. So the evolution of the production value kind of slowly changed, but I think in the final doc, it kind of works well. So this is our extra bed sheet that I found. Uh, makes for a great soft source if you want that nice book light look. And we actually filmed a game show. That was in the beginning of the trailer. Yeah, you saw in the me eating. Of the game show, yeah. And we have the things. whole game shows on YouTube. Can Krista taste this? Yeah. This is where my mind goes. Krista loses her taste and smell. And I think, hey, let's do a cheesy game show where you eat a bunch of like terrible tasting foods and see if you can taste it. The bell pepper is not a good example. I like bell pepper, but okay. the onion, that really got everybody. Yeah. Okay. The bell, I was basically like, what's going to make a good crunch or what's going to be disgusting? So we started out with just the crunchy things. Yeah. 
And this is our home uh, voiceover recording studio. This is me doing my game show announcing on what looks to be a Saturday morning. But let's face it, that could be a Tuesday at five. Yeah, sweatpants. It could, it could be a Thursday There's at no eight. rules in quarantine. It could be a Sunday. I don't know. That's, yeah, it could be any time. Oh, the other thing. Okay, yeah, so we've done a couple rounds of home blood testing. This is what the first one looked like on our iPhone. It's pretty grainy. Uh, handheld's okay. But we've gone through so many testings that I've gotten shots to like reshoot scenes, which has been great. Uh, so this guy was like, he's been to our house three times. That was the first time. And then this was the third time, actually. I was like, all right, we're setting up the counter because we haven't filmed a scene at the counter. We're going to get a really nice big key light. And we're just going to hope that when he walks in that we're like, hey, would you mind doing this in our kitchen counter instead of the table again? Uh, and I'm glad we did because it's probably the best looking footage in the whole documentary. So here we go. Yeah, this guy, he comes from the first time when we're filming on iPhones being like, hey, do you mind if we film you? Like, we're just trying to, you know, capture some of this. And then the next time he's got his, you know, C200. And by the third time he comes in, you know, we've got the lights and the diffusion and it's like this whole, this whole event. Yeah. So I was like, well, this film might suck, but at least I can post this screen grab on Instagram and people will think I'm a good cinematographer. So at least we got that going for us. All right. So let's go. Stop share. Stop share. All right. There we go. We are back live. I think. Perfect. Yep. Yep. All right. Cool. We are. Let me look at my notes. All right. Yeah. So we switched to C200. I'll get into a little bit of post-production, a little distribution, and then I want to open it up to questions because let's face it. I've just been rambling for way too long and it's way more entertaining to hear from Krista. So post-production. Uh, as you guys saw on there, I'm on an old iMac that totally sucks. Uh, the only thing that sucks worse than my iMac is using Premiere Pro on an iMac. So uh, I'm sure Eric Addison is heading to the chat room right now to uh, get me to buy a PC. Here's the thing. I'm trying to get sponsors for this film. So I'm like, what vendors have we used? I'm like, oh, Adobe Premiere. I'm like, I can't reach out to Adobe Premiere because I've pretty much just been cursing their name for the last like two months. So. <laughs> um, use Premiere. The saving grace was I edited everything on a four terabyte uh, Samsung solid state drive, which I actually want to show you guys real quick. Stand back. All right. Sorry about that. That was an un unplanned show and tell. So this is just like a bare, bare drive in here inside of a little uh, silicone housing. Housing that's vented for ventilation. And then just like literally like a $10 USB thing. And it's like, this is incredible. It's like, why mess with all that stuff? If you can fit an entire project on four terabytes, this is like incredible, lightning fast. Uh, I would say I did a really deep dive. Things may have changed in the last couple of months. But if you try to buy a portable solid state drive that's four terabytes or more, um, the housing is going to totally suck and not work with a Macintosh. Uh, if anybody has a good recommendation, throw it in the chat. But you just buy this thing for half the price, put a little piece of silicone on it, boom, you're done. So, um, but then again, I don't know if I should be giving post-production advice because I'm on an old iMac and a crappy version of Premiere. Um, but anyways, we started editing. When I started editing, I had no idea if we actually had a story because I was like, I'm just literally just filming whatever happens to us. Um, and then I started staying up to like, what? The 3.30 in the morning. Yeah, editing. So like every night I would just stay up till Ridiculous. 2, 2.30, 3 o'clock. Or editing. you'd alternate and then, so you might go to bed at like a decent time, 11, 12, and then you'd wake up at like 4 a.m. and your brain would be like, oh yeah, I'm editing a film. And then you wouldn't be able to fall back asleep. That's true. So I have the webcam footage to prove that because it's true. I was recording everything. I was literally like, I don't know what's going on, but I'm going to record it all. So we did that. One other thing I would like to share that kind of, because here's the thing, like we didn't start out like, this is the beginning, we'll get the virus. Um, you'll lose your taste and smell. Um, maybe I'll get really sick. That would be cool. No, like there's, I mean, it's just like real life. We had no idea what was going to happen. Mm -hmm. So I was like, I'm just going to film this. If nothing else, it'll give me something to do. So when I started editing, I was like, I guess we'll just tell it in a linear story like kind of a follow doc type thing um, but one thing that was really helpful 
for me to structure my edit and I'm uh, hitting zoom. screen share. Sorry. Share screen. She's the pro. Bottom. All right. Okay. All right. So I used, I used this guy right here. This was at a talk that I was at like seven or eight years ago. Hopefully you guys can see this. Maybe I can zoom in a little bit. Um, it was somebody who's like a speech writer coach or whatever, but she mapped out all of Martin Luther King's speeches. And she was basically like, um, it's all peaks and valleys. So to keep interest, uh, keep the audience interest, which I hope we're doing right now, who knows if we are, is uh, just going peaks and valleys. So in MLK's speeches, a lot of times what's up at the top would be an ideal of what the future could be. And then he would immediately contrast that down with the, the stark realities that we're facing today. And then he would immediately go back up to like, but this is what could be possible if we all band together, but here's the obstacle. So I just kind of created this timeline and it's probably chicken scratch right now, but I just did each scene. Like what, this scene is a good scene. It's fun, it's entertaining, it's good news. I know that I can't just keep stringing those together. I need to go to what's something we captured that was not fun or that sucked or was something that worried us or when we were feeling bad. So I basically just went through the timeline and tried to ping back and forth from that. And then towards the end, all these items on the right and the pink, oh, here's something interesting. So on the left, everything on the left is basically when we thought the film was finished, like what, like uh, a month ago? A month ago, maybe, yeah. yeah. So we actually had a finished screener that we were actually shopping to agents and stuff that was only like 18, 19 minutes long because I felt a lot of pressure to like, I want to be the first person out there that's got a legit doc. Um, and then the agent that's been working with us the most said we had way too many happy things and not enough struggles. So we needed to, we needed to be a little more authentic and share some of that side too. So everything on the right hand, these are all new scenes that we've done in the last month or so. Um, so as you can see from left to right, it's kind of up and down, up and down, up and down. And then before we get to the ending, there's a lot of down, down, downs in a row. Um, just trying to kind of push it into more of a narrative structure uh, for the ending. So that was kind of my guiding, uh, my guiding light, I guess, for editing. So um, yeah. So I think the last thing we'll talk about is distribution. And then hopefully you guys have some questions that we can answer. Um, right now, so I'll say a long story short, when, when we had like the 17 minute version of the film done, I just threw something out on Instagram and was like, hey, does anybody have any contacts at Netflix? Because at that point, up till that point, I wasn't sure. I was like, this, I don't know if we have a film. And then I started feeling really good about it after a couple of many late nights in a row. And then I showed it to some producer friends of mine and they were like, wow, this is great. Like, this is really timely. Nobody could make a film like this. We think you have something. So I was like, I'm just going to throw this out there. Long story short, one of my friends, that's a lawyer that I've um, had as a video client. Uh, one of the lawyers at her firm has Netflix as a client and he's an entertainment lawyer and has booked a deal with them. Um, so he watched the film and was like, this is great. Like, this is really timely. This is really unique. This is so different than anything else that's out there. I think this has got a shot. Would you like me to pass this along to the head of Netflix or the head of publicity at Netflix? And I had to think about it. And I was like, mm, that quick. Uh, yes. So he sent it to them, but that's, who knows? That could be like a black hole. That could be like scratching a lottery ticket. Yeah. But from there, we got connected with a couple of agents that gave us some really good advice and we've had some really good conversations. So right now we just finished the current screener of the film, or as I like to call it, the final version of the film, which Krista knows means. Oh my gosh, if I had a dollar for every time he has said this is the final version of the film. It, today we filmed our final scene of the film. We hope. Actually, I'm lied. We're filming another one tomorrow. Oh, you're right. Yeah. Anyways. <laughs> but we thought it was going to be the end. No. But anyways, where, what was I saying? Oh, yeah. So, so that's back to a couple of agents. Um, we're starting to get feedback from some producers, um, some people. It sounds so lame to say people in Hollywood, but really some people in Hollywood. Like one of the producers of all the X-Men movies that we uh, met before and we have a connection with, he checked it out. And so we're, we're starting to get feedback. Um, and we're plan B, we're looking at self-distribution options as well. Um, if that doesn't go, we, we have no idea if anybody's going to really want to touch our film, to be honest with you. Um, 
we don't watch a lot of the news because we actually don't have we don't have a TV. Um, but our film is not doom and gloom at all. As you can see, we're here. We're healthy now. We're feeling good. We didn't get it crazy bad. So the main theme about our film is making the best of our situation. So we've been involved, I think, including today, I think between the two of us, I counted like 16 oh, wow. tests or donations or research studies. So basically any opportunity we've had to volunteer to help um, improve the technology, um, work on a vaccine, anything like that, we're like, we'll do it no matter what. So the majority of our film, you see our personal journey and how we've dealt with the illness and how it's affected our livelihood, our finances, um, our health and stuff like that. But it's also really highlighting, okay, how can we make the best out of our situation? And hopefully it entertains people and it also inspires them because I think statistically, the statistics change all the time. Statistically, I think what, like they say, like half the people in America will get I think that's, COVID-19 yeah, I think that's eventually. What saying. I don't know if that's still the... And I think like maybe half of those will either be asymptomatic or have low symptoms or mild symptoms. Yeah. Um, but there's going to be things that those people can do to actually help, like kind of use their unfortunate illness and their journey and what happens in their bodies. They're actually going to be able to use that to then help the people that are on ventilators that are on their deathbeds and stuff like that. So that's really the heart of our film. Um, but we have no idea if anybody's going to want to put their name on it. Like, to be honest with you, like we have a lot of fun along the way. There's a lot of laughs. There are some tears. There might've been some tears today. Actually. Um, hey, sorry. <laughs> sorry. Um, but, uh, but yeah, we, we really have no idea. Like is Netflix is Hulu is CNN is HBO, MTV, I don't know, is anybody going to want to put their name on this because it's not like frontline workers. It's, there's no, there's literally, there's 0% politics, 0% conspiracy theories, and it's 100% just our journey and what we're doing and how we're trying to make the best of it. Yeah. Um, so we hope that people enjoy it. We've gotten really good feedback from the trailer and stuff like that. Um, but I think in the next week or two, I think we'll have an inkling on whether it's got a shot at picking up distribution or whether we're going to self-distribute. And if we self-distribute, probably what we're going to do is we're going to go on to Amazon um, because that's one of the only outlets that you can upload to without the need of an aggregator, which means it basically doesn't cost us anything to get it up there. We can set our own price. And then Amazon keeps 50%. We keep 50%. And then anybody that has an Amazon Fire Stick, a Kindle, an iPad, anybody that has the Amazon app can buy it to rent it or buy it. Um, we could also put it on Amazon Prime if we are into not making any money at all, uh, but getting some views, we can do that. So everybody we've talked to that's gone the self-distribution route um, all say that Amazon is the most profitable. Um, so. You just contradicted yourself. You said Amazon would be no money. Well, Amazon Prime. Oh. Like, so people can oh, watch for it for free. free. Oh, God, like, what's sorry. Because if you, here's something, if you ever, if you want to put your film on Amazon Prime, this is how much money you make. You make between five cents and 10 cents per hour watched. So our film right now is like 43 <laughs> minutes. So it's not even an hour. So if we put it on Amazon Prime for free. So anybody with a Prime account watched it, we would make maybe five, six cents every time somebody watched it, if they watched it. If all they the watched through. the whole thing. So it would be cool to be like, hey, we're on Amazon Prime, but zero money. Yeah. But if we put it out there for rent or buy, that would still pop up in the app. Um, and a lot of independent filmmakers say the algorithm's actually really good. So we're hopeful that if we self-distribute, um, we've been growing our email list through Facebook ads. Um, we've had a lot of like great organic reach just from our friends and family mm -hmm. just sharing it like crazy. So we think that we would have a small enough group to all go out and rent it and buy it and rate it and review it and vote things up as the most helpful review to at least kickstart it. And then from there, then we have no idea. Then we're up to like just the general world and anybody that, you know, wants to say our movie sucks, they can leave that review. And if people vote it up, we might be screwed. <laughs> yeah. So who knows? So, so yeah. I don't know. I've been blabbing. Do you have any final thoughts before we open it to Q&A? No, I say we see what the people want to know. All right. Hopefully you guys are still awake. Hopefully we haven't bored you too bad. <laughs> 
we are still here and I've been seeing a lot of smiles and laughs as uh, your story has gone along. So thank you for that. Um, and it sounds like it's 100% authentic. Like it's really about your story and everything that happened. And uh, um, I, I really appreciate sort of this idea that there's a camera in your face all the time while you're feeling at some of your worst that you've ever felt. So thank you for opening yourselves up to just being um, authentic in that way. So well, Robin, you. David, do you, um, do we have some questions that we would like to share? Um, sure, uh, well, Greg had asked, um, how serious did your illness get and, uh, and how long have you been in recovery? Like how long have you been feeling well? Yeah, so, would you like to answer that? I've been talking uh, so much. Sure. I feel like yeah. we all just want to look and um, look So. This. I, again, Chris is an interesting case because he had kind of been sick and like worn down for like even a month before this. And so, and he had a cough that was just like lingering forever that doctors confirmed like wasn't COVID related. Right. He and, just kind and of And I have cough. allergies too. And I am totally that guy that if somebody hires me for like a big three day shoot and I'm producing and DPing, like I will like get a sinus infection because yeah. I will like stress about it and like just run over the details in my head forever. Yeah. So I make myself sick a lot. So I'm not a good barometer. It's true. So he was honestly, in my opinion, he probably actually was an asymptomatic carrier of COVID. All of his sick, you don't think so? Well, I felt like I had a legit sinus infection for a week. All right. They thought you had a sinus infection. They gave you medicine. They gave you antibiotics. That's true. So anyway, so he has finally recovered. Your cough is mostly gone. It's gone. It's yeah. gone. Okay. It's allergy season, so that's not fun. Yeah. But and I was I developed a cough for about a week, not bad at all. Um, but so the only other thing I had, we never got fevers or anything. Um, so like I said, I lost my sense of taste and smell, uh, which is still not back yet. Um and how long has that been? Uh I think today is day sixty-three. So I'm still dealing with and I'll call that like the the side effects or like the ongoing yeah, side effect, I guess, even though it is technically an official symptom, I've been medically cleared by my doctor. And they've told me that this is just a really long, slow process for some people and gaining it back. So it's like coming back ever so slowly, teeny, teeny, tiny. Um, but I think I am in the minority of how long loss of sense and smell has. Been. Yeah. So you said it's been 63 days. Yeah. Which is so yeah. she, Again, proof that she's way tougher than me. She hasn't literally been able to taste her food or her drinks for 63 days. Eight if weeks. that was me by like day four, I would be like curled up in a ball and just be like, what's the point of living if I can't have my chai tea latte yeah. and I can't taste my pad thai? Just, there's just no point. Just yeah. put me in a coma. But she's a trooper. So. Yeah. So. so I have a technical question. I'm just going to interject and then we'll get to another audience question. I'm curious about matching the footage. Like, what are you doing, or are you not worrying about that? Are you just sort of letting it evolve from the iPhone 11 to your higher quality uh, footage? Yeah, most of the scenes right now are self-contained, so there's not a lot of mixing of footage within a scene. Um, we do have one scene that we filmed that was a doctor's visit that was really educational. It basically shows exactly how the 15-minute serology test works. And that was like a last second call. The doctor called us and was like, hey, can you come now? And so we just like rushed and did it and brought our iPhones. Um, and we're waiting to get the release from that doctor. And in the meantime, Krista is actually doing another test tomorrow. So I'm going to bring my C200 there because they've already agreed to let me film. So there's a chance that there may be a couple of scenes where we, where we kind of intercut the two because there's so much valuable information. And so that'll be interesting. But I think, um, I think what I tried to do just as a, a filmmaker before every scene, I tried to capture our thoughts about what we were getting ready to do first, capture whatever it was, and then afterwards capture our thoughts looking back on that. So I think that leaves for a good place for the, the before and the after to be on the iPhone. Um, so if we do end up having to like recut some scenes, I'm hoping that by keeping them separated at least that much that, that it won't be a problem. Um, but we're, yeah, we're kind of just embracing, like there's, there's totally clips in there, vertical video, um, which I know is probably killing some of you right now. 
it kills me a little bit, uh, where we originally like shot it for an Instagram for an story Instagram or something. Funny post or and something. we're like, oh, this is funny. Like I'm about to give blood and spoiler alert about the film. I do not do good with giving blood and I've given a lot of blood recently. So to get myself hyped up, I would try to make fun of myself, make funny videos on Instagram and stuff. And then I'd be like, let's just put this in the film. So we're kind of just embracing the mixed, the mixed media format, I guess. Which I think is completely acceptable and for better or worse, we're all getting used to Zoom video and audio. So David, do you have another question? Um, I actually do. If you don't mind, I have one for myself. Um, yes. So there is some controversy, obviously, over the wearing of masks and not wearing of masks. And I've noticed in the video, when the gentleman was coming to draw your blood, he would wear a mask. And I don't know what kind of mask he was wearing, but neither of you were wearing masks um, to, uh, for him. So I don't know if, if they had what, what you had learned in this process as far as the mask wearing goes. Yeah, so though that particular footage was our serology testing, so that was after we had already been medically cleared of COVID. We did like we've been medically cleared that we do not have it. You're looking at me as I don't think all of them were. Um, maybe you know what? Maybe the, the first, first one, iPhone yeah. one wasn't. Yeah, and I think honestly, it was so early on, like masks weren't even really in talks yet, other than like save the masks for the medical workers, the N95. Yeah. So I don't even, honestly, I don't even think masks crossed our minds that first time. And they never communicated to us as well. That's true. Like, hey, please wear a mask. Like they were like, they had us open the door and they didn't want to touch the things in our apartment. Um, but I think in those early ones, it was never even, honestly, yeah, that's we didn't true, even because it's crazy. Think about it. It's crazy how much has changed so quickly yeah. that literally like even when we, two months ago, when we first went into testing, for testing, I mean, we didn't wear masks even for the drive up testing, I don't think. Not mine. Like the doctor was like all super like garbed up, but it just the thought never even crossed our mind and they never they didn't say like to wear masks. And so yeah, yeah so it was, I guess it was pre mask era, I think. Yeah, which is crazy to think about because it, it seems yeah. like we've all been wearing masks That's a good for a while. Point. But um yeah, no, like when we did some of the other testing, like when we went to the hospital and stuff, we're definitely wearing masks for that. I don't know. If any of that footage was in there um so when we've gone outside of our house we've worn masks but um that's an interesting thought like i didn't that hadn't even yeah hadn't even occurred to me. me yeah so no, good catch but yeah they just none of the doctors told us to and that was literally before yeah it was before they were required i don't even yeah. think we had masks then yeah no i don't think so i mean we got a ton of them now but. awesome thank you um julianne valera are you there yes did you want to ask your question Okay, so one thing I'm wondering is, since there are so many people making coronavirus documentaries, what makes your documentary different than the other documentaries besides the fact that the filmmakers are the sick ones? Sure. Well, I think, I mean, I think that is obviously the, the big differen differentiator. Um, the articles I've read about the docs that are in production, obviously I haven't seen any of them or seen their promos. The, the only ones I've seen out in existence are um, the controversial ones that are like the Chinese coronavirus conspiracy or, theory. Or yeah. it's like the, what was the other one? Plandemic. Plandemic and yeah. stuff like that. So a lot of that stuff is super political. And then the articles I've read on like, I think variety and stuff like that, um, that filmmakers, their angle has been like, or they've been following the front lines of the New York City um, uh, emergency department, or it's people making it industry-based. There's so many athletes that are making docs right now about how this has changed the landscape of the sports world. I know there's a lot of big names in the restaurant world that are doing documentaries about how this is financially just totally wrecking um, restaurants. So to my knowledge, I haven't heard of or seen anything that's like a personal follow doc. Um, and I think like our unique, our unique thing, I guess, is that I'm a filmmaker um, and I got it super early. So in a, in a weird way, I kind of got like a couple month head start on any other film. Like I still haven't heard of a single filmmaker that's gotten it. We've heard of actors and celebrities. Yeah. And I don't know, like too, I, you guys know better than me, the restrictions currently, like, I don't even know can the documentary people right now go to someone and film them right now? Or is it all over Zoom? 
Yeah, a lot of a lot of things I've heard too are a lot of like thought pieces. So it's like I think there's something on Netflix right now that's got Bill Gates and stuff, and it's literally just all talking head interviews. And some of the stuff I've seen is like um, it's a lot of Zoom interviews and stuff like that. I think we've probably all seen that content. And I think we just honestly we hit probably the average American. We're not frontline workers. We're not athletes. We're not celebrity chefs. Like we just work. I work a nine to five in an office. Like. I think we hit like our story is like middle America. It's true. Yeah. So, so yeah, we'll see. I mean, we, and, and there I, may not be an audience. We don't know. Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. I think we'll get, I think we'll get that feedback in the next week or two as we hear back from agents and distributor distributors of whether to like, Hey, we have 40 other documentaries that we're planning on making. Like maybe nobody wants to touch ours, but we just tried to stay true to like, Hey, let's just focus on our story and our story only. Um, not that it's like just about us because it's obviously the whole thing of the film is to inspire people to give back and help others and do whatever they can out of their the, the hand that's dealt with them um so we don't know we really don't know what the what the what the reception is going to be like but to my knowledge i don't know of a single other filmmaker that's gotten the virus i think you know this has been around for a while now and we only know like, like one, one other person, person yeah. and we don't really know them that well that's got it so there's definitely a timeliness element to it like I don't know if anybody's going to care about our documentary in another two three four months yeah. I have you know I have no idea like it's such a weird changing landscape but yeah I'm sorry I'm rambling but I would say yeah I'd say the fact that we're that I'm a filmmaker and I've actually documented our entire process this isn't us telling our story that already happened and reenacting it this was like captured as it went so or it could just be my mom says i'm special you know like that's, that's true my <laughs> mom will love this film. you know so yeah so i think your mom will love it too. it's true but so. yeah good question that's and according to our data on facebook the trailer is going great with moms like <laughs> ages like 50 to 64 Thanks. women they're eating it up so david what's oh, our next great. question um, uh, lv o'connell uh, i see you're here with us did you want to ask the question that you posed in the chat You're still on mute. Uh, hey. Lauren. Hi. Hi. Hey. Thank you guys so much for doing this and sharing your story. I, you know, I think you guys are uh, fun to watch together. So I think you're ahead thank of the you. game there with everybody else. <laughs> you know. Awesome. Um, thank you. My question was um, sort of legally: How did you handle that? Um, you know, going into medical professionals, sort of surprise. Can I film you? That how did all that work? Yeah, well, we're still working some of that, <laughs> some yeah. of that out. Um, basically, well, the majority of the film is just me and Krista. So I'd say like 80% of the content. Have you signed your release yet? I did today. Okay. All right. Just signed my release. As we were getting some other, I was like, oh, I need to sign mine. <laughs> yeah, so basically we have releases for everybody. The only, the only people we don't have releases for are some of uh, the doctors and nurses who administered some of the tests. And so I filmed those intentionally to where I could keep their face out of it just in case we couldn't get releases. There were a couple of faces that we did blur. I will say, now this is an interesting thing. When somebody, a doctor is in their proper gear, how in the world do you know who that is? Because they're literally like, we're doing, we're doing like drive up testing in a like, dank parking garage that's like light. underlit and they yeah. come up with a clear mask they're masked up to here and then they've got like you're getting the reflection off of their mask yeah and then it's already like low exposure so i'm like do i have to blur their face out because there's no way you can tell who this is but uh, we do have one doctor that called us to participate in the serology test. And so we just brought our iPhones and like we just explained as soon as we were there, like, hey, like I'm a filmmaker, we're documenting our journey for a documentary. Is it okay if we film? And most people, if you seem nice, say yeah. And so she said, yeah, we were filmed. She knows we were being filmed because she's literally on camera looking at her camera, explaining to us the testing and what they're doing and we're yeah. chatting through the whole thing but I don't have a release from her yet. I actually just emailed her today. She might be a tough cookie, but I think uh, what we have in our back pocket is that we volunteered for her test yeah. and she, her and her practice stood 
to gain a lot from getting their, their stuff approved. So, and I think too, as just kind of the journey it's taken and as we learned, as we went on kind of how we evolved from iPhones to whatever, like even now, like, so we just, said, I'm doing something tomorrow. He did something today. We're in advance when they reach out to us about, Hey, can you come in to do such and such? We respond with like, yes, we would love to. Also, we're working on a documentary. would love to showcase the work that your organization is doing. Can we film? And so for the last couple of things we've done, we've had, you know, um, the, I can't think of the word, the permission, permission. Ahead of time. Thank you. Permission ahead of time. And so we have met with like the PR head today of place and so we're coming with our releases they know we're filming so that's also kind of been an evolution as well and kind of a learning curve that yeah looking back on it or for the next thing we'll be more prepared but totally because yeah when we started out even though in my mind it was a documentary when we were starting out we didn't know what we were going to do with this like originally like for the first month i thought i was just going to post this on youtube be like hey maybe we'll get this out there. like an instagram lot you know an instagram video or something, or something. That, yeah um and so we've started to take it more serious. And so like, yeah, today we went to a medical appointment and uh, ahead of time had like their head of PR was escorting us like mm -hmm. full permission. Yeah. Uh, the test tomorrow, which is one of those ones that we might refilm and replace one of the scenes in our film. If we can't get a release like that's, yeah, they know going in, we're making a documentary. So um, if you're okay with us filming, we're bringing releases and here's, here's what we want, Here, this, this, and this. Um, I'll admit I'm totally like a non-confrontational person slash wuss. So like asking people for stuff like that just sounded so crazy to me. But after talking to some other um, people who have produced and distributed documentaries, they're like so gung-ho and like, oh, you just gotta be upfront and be like, you know, here's what we're trying to do. So that's kind of what we're doing now. So I think we'll see how it goes. It, there, I think there's only one scene that I would need to re-edit if we don't get that doctor's release because that still showcases the whole process um, and there's no way you'd be able to identify her. So that might be something that hangs up for traditional distribution, but I think if we end up going self-distribution, we'll probably just roll the dice and um, blur faces that need to be or recut scenes. Um, one thing that we actually talked about today during lunch is if this doctor won't sign her release, for the serology testing, I'm probably just gonna start calling places that are doing serology testing and be like, here's what we're doing. We're doing this documentary. We think it's got a lot of potential. It's got a lot of great feedback and it's 100% positive. And we're wanting to celebrate the groundbreaking medical work that you guys are doing. And we wanna feature you in the documentary. So we're kind of coming at it from that point now where two months ago it was kind of like, like oh, will is you it do okay us if we film favor? this? Yeah, so. So, but everybody we filmed gave us a verbal okay. Yeah. So it wasn't like hidden camera or anything. Yeah. So anyways, I don't know if that answered your question, but that's, that's kind of where we're at right now with that. David, who's next? Um, ah, uh, Greg. Greg had a question about LLC. Are you there, Greg? I am here. And I'm wondering, is this film its own legal entity or are you producing it through your own corporation or as, or are you producing it as individuals? Hey, Greg. I'll say, I'll say hi first. It's good to see your face. Um, right now, we're just producing it under my LLC. So I have a production company that's an LLC. So um, if we hear back from like distribution or people that are interested for like legal purposes or stuff like that, that's something that I would definitely be interested in looking into. I think we're going to learn a lot if, if a distributor is like, hey, we want this film. I think I'm going to be baptized into the, to the world of legal. Luckily, I do have uh, Nicole Franco, who hopefully is watching, if you are. Hi, Nicole. She's my consultant producer on this project, and she's uh, produced feature films that have gotten distribution through like Sony and stuff like that. So she's kind of gone through this process. And the guy that did all the legal for her film, he's the main agent that's been working with us. So I think, um, yeah, I think if we get distribution, we're going to look into some of that stuff as far as what we need to do to protect ourselves during the film. But I think if we self-distribute, we'll probably just keep it under our LLC and see what happens. Okay, thank you. Um, I think that's, I think we have one more question. Um, let's see if Kevin Baird, are you available there? Howdy. Yeah, you had a question. 
Uh, I had a couple of them actually. Uh, my last one was, um, what did you leave out that you kind of wanted to keep in but didn't really want to put in and why? Um, Funny you should Chris ask. is laughing because something happened today that we probably can't say what happened today. It was a spoiler. They, so, oh, man, follow up via email <laughs> and we'll, we'll tell you after the film's up. So, something so we did something today, we filmed the ending, what we think is the ending Wait of a minute, film. you're going to tell us that it's not COVID-19, but it's an STD or something like that? <laughs> uh, no, maybe we should get tested for that too. No, uh, I did have to answer some weird questions on some of the questionnaires today. Um, oh man, I want to tell this story, but I can't tell. All right, I'll just say this. We did something today. This is going to spoil the film a little bit, so... If you enjoy the story, you have to rent or buy this film. Oh, I if you don't want a spoiler, you plug your ears. Yeah, but it's spoiler. a funny story. Okay, so today, I won't say what I did, but I did uh, a medical procedure that went great and served its purpose and accomplishment. Uh, but midway through, uh, something happened, uh, which is why I'm wearing this bandage. Uh, let's just say there was a puddle of my blood uh, on the floor and all over my arm. Uh, and it was pretty dang entertaining. If I was making a reality show, that would be in every teaser clip that I could possibly think of. Um, but we're not going to put it in because... We probably won't because it'll, it'll, it'll probably make the medical place look bad. Even though it wasn't necessarily their fault, yeah, like it was, it was just, just a, a weird just a freak thing that happened. Um, freak accident's a strong word. That's okay. Well, it was, it was a, just a, a mishap. A, freak, a, freak, a mishap. It was a freak bloodbath. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, we'll see. I'm gonna edit that scene. I don't think they. I don't think I can do that because they've been so nice. They let us like. They had a PR. Yeah, they were like, great. They, they like rolled out the red carpet for anything we wanted to do. Yeah, and it just so, so happened that they made a slight error that involved a major, <laughs> major bloodbath, which was extremely, uh, extremely entertaining. And I, so I get really squeamish around that stuff. So which this was really like, helped that. Yeah, yeah, this was like one of the hardest things I've had to do. I was like, don't look. In a long time. So I actually didn't see any of it. I felt it. You're bleeding out. Don't look. Yeah, I felt it, but I didn't look. But then when we got home, I looked at the footage because today was actually the first shoot we did with us, other cinematographer. Because oh, yeah. until that point, it had either been me filming Krista or me like putting the C200, setting the settings, turning autofocus and giving it to her to film me. Um, and this was the first time because we were like, this is the end of the film and we need to both be in, in the scene. Um, so he got a lot of great footage and we had a lot of laughs watching it back. And I think it would, it actually ties in perfectly to the theme of our film uh, of like bad things happen. You try to do something good out of it. And then that's met with a new bad thing. And then you try to do like, something good out of that. You can't that. control most yeah. things in life, you know? And it's this was just fun. an example of even when you're trying to do something good, you're, you can't control whatever, but yeah, well, that will, probably not make it in just on our initial chat is because we don't want to paint the yeah. company or this person yeah. in any bad light to make it look like an error on their behalf but so that's something that's not in the film that but yeah i so want to <laughs> show that to everybody like it's if it wouldn't like spoil the, the, like, the ending of our film i would be posting that everywhere today well we're looking forward to the story from your perspective instead of one of these bizarre political or conspiracy movies so you know i know a couple people that have had it that are kind of like in your boat where they just like live in their lives and then they get this weird sickness and that they don't know what it is because it's too early for anybody and, and they're like whoa and then you know they're documenting on facebook or you know whatever it is and and blogging whatever and and uh so I think there would definitely be a market for a story like this that just feels like normal COVID instead of freaky COVID. And don't feel bad about your reaction to the blood because I passed out just listening to that story. So <laughs> oh, yeah, um, we should have given like a oh, yeah, warning because you would <laughs> need that. <laughs> yeah. um, and I think we have just one more question from uh, Bob. Bob Unger, you're with us, correct? Uh, Bobby, you still I don't know whether you were going to unmute me or I did it myself. Oh, there he is. Your comment about leaking the blood. Remember my first time my daughter got blood work done. She was looking at her arm and said, oh, rad. 
Anyway, my question is, is that now that you've had the virus, are you safe to go out and shoot other people with live virus and be able to embed some other people's stories to give some other perspectives on people go, or you pretty much have to be concerned that you might recatch it? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, it's so weird because the information just keeps changing as more and more data comes in. Because like when we when we first had it, like whatever, two months ago, we did an interview with um, the CEO and founder of one of the main serology testing companies. Like if, if you get a serology test here in San Diego, it'll probably be from their company. Um, and we did our tests and it showed up that like I had uh, like an, an antibody response or whatever. And at that time he felt pretty comfortable with like, he's like, I'm not your doctor, so I'm not gonna say this, but you should probably have immunity for like a year to three years. Um, but we've since done other tests and other research has come out and it's kind of like for now, we kind of just have to pretend um, that we haven't had it or could get it again. Um, I'm sure more information will come out on that. Um, but that's kind of how we're just acting anyways. So um, personally, I think personally we feel good because we didn't have it like crazy, you know, like, I don't know if we got it again, if we would get it worse or if it right. would be less. Like we were never like fearful for ourselves getting it per se. Um, and so I think we still are going about it like, oh, yeah, we don't want to get it again. I mean, shoot, I'm still dealing with problems from the first time, you know, still can't taste or smell. Um, but yeah. And I yeah. think in terms of like, we're still taking all of the like precautions, but I think he's saying like in a video realm, would you like, how are you treating? Yeah. Well, that'll be interesting because when it first, when I first got it and started, this is where my brain was at. When I first got it, I was like, man, I'm going to update my like production hub profile. I'm going to blast it everywhere that like, I'm the, I'm immune like safest I'm, person I'm you can hire cinematographer in san diego that you can hire funnel all your jobs to me i'm not worried um but now as i'm starting to like kind of hear more stories yeah, of what people sure are having to true. do on set it just seems like a pain in the butt um to like follow all the the proper protocol and stuff like that so to be honest like i've my bread and butter is client work and all of that has pretty much disappeared um, and I've wanted to do original content and transition into original content for a long time. Um, I've got a background in documentary, um, but I've also got some narrative work, like our short film that we made last year won uh, the San Diego International Film Festival for both best local film. So the last couple of years, I've gotten more and more long form projects, longer documentaries. Um, and that's really what I want to do. So from a business perspective, I'm like, I've kind of wanted to cut down on client work and do more original stuff. And we've just never made that jump because in order to do that, I would have to say no to all the paying jobs, which I think would probably be a tough sell to Krista. Like, yep. hey, I want to do this passion project where I'm going to make zero money, but it's got potential to further my career. <laughs> the only drawback is I'm going to make zero dollars for the next two or three months. Um, so it always seemed like that was such a big risk. And then uh, COVID just kind of, took away that risk because it took away all my jobs anyway. So uh, it, it'll be weird to see like if this project, what it does for my career, like if it helps launch me more into that original content space, cause that's where I want to be. So I guess that would maybe be like the, one of the ultimate making lemonades out of the situation is if this, this crappy virus that's ruined our industry and has taken away all of my work um, ends up being the thing that helps me uh, make the jump into original long form content, uh, that would be awesome. So, um, so we'll see. So I guess I didn't really answer your question too much, but I'm not really thinking about client work, to be honest. And like, I've just been living in this documentary bubble for two months and trying to get us to the finish line, which I feel like I'm currently crawling across, <laughs> but yeah, we'll see. Sorry. I probably, that would probably wasn't a good answer to your question. Well, so you, by the fact you weren't willing to go out and you're, concerned you could catch it again. I was curious too, you were commenting that uh, you didn't want your neighbors to know that you had it. And I imagine now they all know because it's hard to have those people coming in in bunny suits and not be obvious about it. <laughs> that, oh, we were so worried. True. The very first one, because the first one that came was like in the mo like heat of when we had it. It was literally like from the ET hazmat. Scene. Yeah. And like we were like peering out the windows to like see like 
how can we get them in with going, you know, unnoticed? And then we kind of, it was mainly me when I worked through the emotional about like feeling like the stigma and this is my fault or whatever. And then kind of worked through that and realizing like, okay, I didn't do anything wrong, whatever. And we're following things. And then especially once we recovered, then it's like, well, people can now know, you know? Yeah. So yeah, we kind of don't. Yeah. It was weird too, because when Krista first got it and had to tell her work and HR and stuff, it was very much like we felt like we were lepers. Yeah. Like we were like unclean. We have to like stay away from everybody. And so we really didn't want anybody to know. It's like, we wanted to tell our friends and family. Cause we um, didn't want to like, if our neighbors saw us like walk outside into the courtyard to get some fresh air, we didn't want yeah, them to be live, like, we live in what an apartment are you doing? Complex. Like you have it, you know? So like, that's where we were pretty on the down low when we had it because of yeah, yeah just so it was a weird people's even like the opinion. question about the masks like this last two months has been like two years because like at the beginning we were like we don't want anybody to know that we have it and like early on now like, we're making a documentary yeah, we want the world to know the more on, people that know the better yeah early on we did we did an instagram live with our friends and family and we knew that none of her coworkers followed her and none of our neighbors followed us on social media so yep. we felt like we're kind of That's, like skipping our immediate circle. Yeah. So that was probably safe. But then literally the next day I got a thing from NBC News, San Diego, that was like wanted to do a story on us. I um, and I was like, and I had to say no, because we were like, we know our neighbors don't follow us on Instagram. Yeah, but they watch the but news. They probably, like, watch, the they news, probably so, watch the news. So yeah, we're yeah, like, we didn't want anybody you know. to know. But and then later, as as the docu as the documentary grew, and then we're seeing it more as like a business opportunity and potential. And then it's again as we're getting healthy, then it kind of turned a corner where the first news story was about us, where we weren't looking for anything. But now it can be like, oh, this is about this documentary. Yeah. And like so that kind of changed our yeah. tune as well. So the first time the blood man came, we were like shaking and nervous, like let's get him in here quick. And then by the third time he came, we're like. Like, hey, good to see you again. Yeah, hey, Tony. We're in the <laughs> kitchen today. Yeah. I've, I've got a bigger light set up. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, it just kind of changed over time. Or I didn't like the way you walked up the stairs. Can you do it a little more slowly? Right, right. Exactly. Yeah. Put the bag do it, in do it, front do hand. Do it with me. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, do it with, with me. me. Right, exactly. Let's get this timed out right. Yeah. Totally. Am I seeing I, a hand up, Greg? Do you have a question? I do. Uh, in my previous life, uh, I interviewed the author of Patient Zero, Randy Shills, in San Francisco. And I'm wondering, do you have any idea how this came to visit you? That is a great question. Um, me? Because it's on me. We, at first, we assumed that I gave it to Krista because I had had a cough for a little while. But, like, going back and re... Cause I like contacted everybody that I'd been around and I'd been on a lot of shoots recently and stuff like that. Not a single person has gotten it or if they did, they were all asymptomatic. So we think. I think that, so on that last Friday that I worked, I left the office and again, I. Which was the first day of quarantine. The first right? day of lockdown. Or lockdown or whatever. Yeah. March 20th. I had gone to the grocery store and I actually had, um, donated blood that day just because she's a good person i try to she be does it out of goodness i like heart. to be a blood donor um and it was again this is the very beginning where just like you were we were taking things serious but it wasn't to the point where again masks weren't required you know kind of whatever and it was and they were taking precautions like they were taking our temperature it was a mobile station so it's like a giant bus um and this is all just speculation in my thought but like you're using a shared clipboard and a shared pen that other people have touched. And then the nurse is handing me some papers. And then after you're done, you sit in the cantina and have some snacks. And I hadn't washed my hands after any of that. And so I'm like eating an Oreo that I had unwashed hands after sharing a pen and whatever. And so my personal just thought is that I maybe picked it up there um, because then they say the average time from exposure to symptoms is um, five days. And it was five days later that I first started noticing that maybe tightness in my chest. Um, so that's just my hypothesis, but- And it was uh, like what, day six that you lost your- Day, day seven snow? that I lost my yeah. snow. So and that was like that afternoon that she lost it. We went through a drive-through coffee shop 
and she, you could taste the drink, right? Uh, yeah. You could taste the drink. And that was literally like four o'clock, three o'clock in yeah. the afternoon. And then that night at dinner, dinner, I couldn't taste my food. At eight o'clock, she couldn't taste her food. Yeah. So that was, yeah, six days after that. Yeah. So So that's just my hypothesis that when I was out and about on that Friday and just looking back at my actions, because I specifically know I ate an Oreo cookie that I touched with my own hands. Dang Oreos. (laughs) After touching probably a shared pen and a shared clipboard. That's just my hypothesis. But officially yeah. i don't i don't it is know. crazy like what are the odds because she probably got it on the first day of lockdown, lockdown and that was like i don't know if you remember that it was like the governor came on a thursday night and was like lockdown it was like you're like what? Well, all my stuff's at work on friday yeah I like i literally had so to go she, into work for a half day to like throw the milk away in the fridge and kind of all of those things and then that um, may or may not have been the day that yeah. she got it so yeah but it's also i mean we don't know though to be honest it could have come from an amazon box that i her groceries. I was never great. I was never that person that was like sanitizing all of my groceries for three hours before I like three days. Or, so. Yeah, three days. I don't know. So this is just my hypothesis. But again, there's it's the crazy thing about this. There's no way to trace back like where where you got it. Yeah. So yeah. None of us were sanitizing at that point. Right. Yeah. Also right. that. Yeah. Yes. Uh, Bob, I see your hand. Just to follow up on that, did you by chance check with the blood bank and say that that's your thought of where you might have gotten it? Because obviously they test the blood and would be able to tell if any of those donators that day had had the virus in their system. Um, So I did. I definitely followed up with them to let them know that I had contracted it because, again, they then, you know, took my blood and they're saying, like, it's not shown that it can transfer through blood, but they were, you know, pulling it off. Um, But I didn't like ask about kind of whatever and just kind of one assumed that like for HIPAA reasons or whatever, they might not even be able to tell me that information. Um, but no, I didn't actually, yeah, follow up with them about if, if I thought that's where I got it other than to let them know that, Hey, I did, you know, test positive for this. So you don't use my blood. And no antibodies in there. <laughs> did you guys do your own contact tracing or did, or was it done like medically? Uh, we did our own. Um, yeah, at that point. Well, and then we got a call from the San Diego. We did. And we're, I'd say we're not very political people at all. We're pretty, <laughs> we're pretty peaceful people, but it is kind of strange. We've gotten some weird phone calls. That's like, like, is somebody tracking us now? Do we have, like, yeah, right. Um, do we have a, like a tracker built into Yeah, us? I would say, I think they, t- gosh, I'm trying to remember. They told, did they tell us? Like to contact, because I know we definitely, we went back and he contacted all of his people. You had to that, for work. And for work, I definitely had to. And then even I remember texting some people from like our community group. I can't remember. Did we self-initiate that? We must have been told that by. Yeah, I think we self. I think we self We self did it. But I'm, I'm one of those people, like when you see the memes, when you're like an editor in real life and an editor in quarantine, it doesn't look any different. That's basically my life. I'm an, I'm an introvert. So if I'm not, if I'm not on set DP in somebody's shoot, I am uh, trying to interact with this. His world's pretty as small possible. as so it is. Yeah. My contract tracing was basically like, Krista, I think I was around you. Yeah. No, I, I told everybody that I was on a shoot with. Um, and yeah, that's, that's wild. Cause Krista had some some people that were really fearful coworkers, and I had some people too that like once word got out like people started calling me and like tell me your symptoms like what happened blah 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 luckily nobody was mean about it was like what were you doing on set but um yeah I guess that's interesting because because again we had it so early where I think now there's definitely more measures in place that's true um but again go back two months like they were still developing all this so yeah it was kind of on us and that's a good question I honestly don't remember if I think one time when the county called me, I think they asked if I had contacted everyone I'd been in contact with the previous 14 days, which let's just say is really hard to do. <laughs> like, yeah, I can imagine. If, if I were to ask you, like, can you name every person that you've been in contact with in the past two weeks? I'm like, no, like that's really hard. Yeah. I so live with two people and I couldn't tell you if I have had right? contact exactly. with them today. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, so I, I basically just told anybody that I could think of. Yeah. And none of them ever got any symptoms. So yeah. I don't know if it was just like, yeah, like if it was Krista literally picking it up on her last stop before quarantining yeah. and then bringing it into the yeah. house. Or, or I mean, because it's so, I think the most recent stat I saw was 30% of people are asymptomatic. Don't quote me on that because that could be wrong. Um, but so like 
I literally could have picked it up from an asymptomatic person at my office. And, but I was the one that showed symptoms tested positive. And so then it was kind of on me that everyone's getting this information. Whereas, but, but no one else from the office said that they got it. Yeah. yeah I don't know. It, that's was just so weird because of the, there's so many asymptomatic people or low symptoms. Like you, one of you said, you know, like, Oh, I got kind of sick, but I didn't quite realize what it was. Like, I mean, like we said, that's what it would have been with Chris. If it hadn't been for me, yeah. it was such an interesting losing my taste and smell. We would have just thought, yeah, I'd like to throw an interesting random stat out for you guys. We learned this in one of our interviews, and the stat for San Diego has actually held up over the two months that outside of like New York City and some of those hot spots, but San Diego specifically, four out of all the people that have symptoms and they're they're convinced that they may have it. Of all the people that have tested. And actually go and get a test because they're like, I've got a fever, or I'm sick or whatever. Only four percent of those people actually test positive for COVID-19 so there's like we've heard so many stories of people that are like oh in January I felt this way or February I felt this way um so that's like pretty wild that like um I'm not gonna make any political statements here but like that yeah just out of all the people that think they have it and go get tested because they think they have only four percent actually do so uh I think it's to be honest I think it was just a fluke that we got it yeah so I and I feel like I should go buy a lotto ticket because we're like in the minority, you know? True. That's true. And we probably, if she hadn't lost her taste and smell, we would have we probably never, never gotten tested. Totally. Because um, yeah. when I first tried to get tested after she tested positive, my healthcare provider was like, nope, we're only testing people that have testing to be admitted. Testing was so limited. Hospital. Again, two months ago. Like, so yeah. I just called her doctor and was like, hey, you know my that lady did. you just said had it? I live with her. Uh, I need to know whether I have it or not because... I have a shoot next week yeah. that I probably need to cancel, but I need to know if I need to cancel it. So yeah, yeah. So a lot has changed. Back um, distribution. Oh, oh, sorry, David. Yeah, okay. we had a follow-up question on distribution from uh, Al Lefcourt. Al, are you there? I don't know if he's still here. Yeah, he's there. There he is. I see it, Al. Uh, he might still be on mute. Hi, Al. Hey. Hi guys. Uh, hey. Real quick, you mentioned two ways of distributing through Amazon. One was the Amazon Prime streaming. What was the other one? Um, so you can also upload it. It's all through the same system, and then you can just pick whether it's like I think the term is SVOD or TVOD subscription video on demand, which would mean if you have Amazon Prime, you can watch it for free, or TVOD, which I think means transactional video on demand. Um, But you can set that. We haven't gone through the process yet, but basically um, you can do it that way. So you can set your own price. So we'll probably, if we do it that way, it'll probably be three or $4 for the rental and like eight to 10 bucks for the purchase. But you get to choose whether you want to do that or not. So you can choose whether you want it to be on Amazon Prime for free and I'll get five to 10 cents per hour watch, which I don't know how many people would have to watch it to make any money on that. But (laughs) Maybe if I went viral, no pun intended, um, we could make a couple thousand bucks. I don't know. But I think our best chance is doing doing the TVOD route, which will probably set a rental price and a purchase price. Hopefully, like all our relatives will do the purchase part. And then all of our friends will at least do the rental part. And then it's just, we're just basically playing the algorithm game. Like it, it sounds like, like if, if you follow any authors that release books on Amazon, you know how they're like, pre-order and write your have your review written ready and write yeah all that so we can probably play that game forgive my ignorance but where do you go to do that just open up amazon and yeah just on just on amazon like whether it's the app or it's the amazon video oh to to to, to, i'm sorry to self-distribute yes yeah i think if you just google uh i forget what they call it but if you just google like Amazon video distribution, like it'll, it'll be one of the first things to pop up and it's a pretty simple thing. Okay. Um, the other, the other way that most people do self distribution will be through an aggregator through a service like Qu- uh, quiver. If you Google yeah. quiver, you can see that, or basically you pay a flat fee that starts out at like 1500 bucks. And then it's kind of a la carte after that, but basically you can do it through there and they basically make sure that all your files are the right format and that you have your closed captioning and you have your poster artwork and all the different dimensions that they're going to need. And then basically they aggregate that all the way out to like iTunes, Amazon, Vimeo on demand, um, 
all those types of things. So you can, cert you can certainly do it that route, but everybody we've talked to is like 75% of our sales come from Amazon. So even though it's cool to be on iTunes, um, nobody's going to find you there. <laughs> um, and that require, Amazon actually has a really good a algorithm trailer? for recommending your okay. films. Do they require a trailer? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Trailer is definitely one of the requirements. Gotcha. Thanks. Yeah. Happy to help. Well, Chris and Krista Francis, thank you so much for being here with us tonight. This has been absolutely fascinating. And uh, I really appreciate all of your insights. And I, uh, I think about how my husband would feel if he were ill and I was in a space with a camera. So thank you for your bravery and for telling us your story tonight. And someone did ask, um, are you interested in having us share your trailer? Is there a way that the filmmaking community here in San Diego and beyond can support you in these efforts? What, would, what could we do? Yeah, that would be great. I think the number one ask would be to sign up for our email list um, on our film, on our website, which is makinglemonade.film, so .film. That would probably be the best way. Um, basically, like what we've been told by some of the uh, agents and stuff is that they're going to look at our YouTube, um, our Facebook. They, they want to see like comments. That, like it doesn't have to go viral. We just need to see that there's an actual need or a desire to want to see the film. So, okay. um, so interacting with you is one way to build the audience and um, interest from distrib distributor distributors. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that would be great. And I think if you, if you do really want to support the film, if we go self distribution route, um, we'll get all that info out via the email, of like where you can rent the film and stuff like that. But I, I think our biggest ask that we're going to have for anybody that would like to support our journey is if we do self distribution is when we launch to like rent or buy the film that first week and to leave a review and rate it and a good review. Yeah. yeah. I mean, <laughs> if you think the film sucks, like totally, that's fine. Just, just tell us just, personally, just, just, yeah, just leave just don't, it off. Just don't write the review. Um, and then one thing I'm learning too, cause I have a buddy that self distributed on Amazon and he's done really well on Amazon but I looked up his film the other day on Amazon and the first two reviews are one star reviews that just basically are just like ripping the film. And that shows up because the most people have voted that most helpful. So, Oh my God. So I think like, and it's a good documentary too. It was like really, really well done. And it was by a San Diego guy too. But uh, like one thing, I think that's going to be our big ask is basically to help us you know, scratch our lotto ticket at Amazon by, you know, juking the algorithm by renting it, uh, leaving a review, and then also voting up, uh, like, positive Other reviews. Positive so, reviews, yes. And then after that, you know, it's just, it's out of our hands at that point. Yeah, that's right. Well, thank you so much for being here with us tonight. Um, I see some people applauding, even though it's oh, cool. silent and applause. Thanks. So yeah, this has been you. super We'll go gallery view here so we can see everybody. Yay. Yeah, exactly. We can go to gallery view. Good to see everybody. Uh, I don't know that anybody had put anything into the chat that they were pressing and really wanted to talk about tonight. Tom, am I seeing you? Raise your, did you have a, something for us? Or I can also just uh, wrap it up by saying our next meeting is scheduled for Wednesday, June 24th. And if you have any ideas about something that you might like to talk about in terms of changes in the industry, uh, just whatever is on your mind with um, filmmaking and media production in San Diego, send me an email. Uh, you can find that address on the SDMP uh, website. And uh, also, we have been posting a lot of resources on the website, so take a look at that when you have a chance. And uh, thank you for being here tonight. We really appreciate all of you. Oh, and Bob Unger is also a member of the board. I meant to mention his name earlier. Thank you, Bob, for all of the work that you do, that important work. Um, he manages our finances and can do it without you. So thank you very much and um, see you next month, everybody. All right, cool. Thanks for having us, guys. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. That was great. Good meeting. Yes, thank you, everybody. I might add one little tidbit that has come to my attention as I've been playing with this is yes. if you're using OBS, you can also, if you need an image in your background or something, you can use a Photoshop document. Say that again, Bob.
Photoshop. Using, using, using Photoshop imaging to create your spaces, if you will. For any image that you want to use in OBS, you can actually Photoshop uploaded to OBS. And if you make any change in Photoshop, it's immediately reflected in OBS when you save it. You don't have to actually export it as a JPEG and then use that in your OBS. Yeah. Oh, it's a uh, connected uh, kind of um, image. That's nice. Yeah, you can use yeah, it kind of like a Chiron cool. generator for lower That's thirds. I thought I'd share it. Nice, yeah. nice. I, I do, I had, I, I, I was able, I went back again after we had already started. Um, so we're live on YouTube, even though our guests have, have uh, left now. <laughs> yeah, you're still recording too, Tom. I, I am, and uh, I'm trying to find out where to turn it off. <laughs> uh, and we're, we're still Forever. here if you guys need it us. It says live, yeah. but I'm, I'm not seeing the button that says turn it off. I had actually noticed that we were live on YouTube, Tom, because it, it I have a little indicator here on the screen. It does. Oh, so you, you go up here. Okay. You, you probably I did, uh, you, you kill I posted it that on Facebook about uh, a okay. third of the way through. So thank you for that. Yes. Oh, and, great, Jane. It was weird. I mean, it just worked exactly the way it did the first time. Uh, it's just, you know how it is, you know, sometimes you got to, and that's why I kept trying. That's, um, I mean, even um, Chris's comment about, of course, the drive went down immediately right after I tried to use it, you know. And I'm just going, yes, that's, that's part of our job, dealing with technology that, is it 80% even? I mean, it breaks. It, it, you set it up one way, it worked fine last time, you got to reset it up. Um, right at the beginning of this, I had to unplug my Medgewell and replug it in before everything would work again. The expression is failure is not an option, it comes standard. It comes standard. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, you know, um, Murphy's Law is alive and well in everything we do. I mean, just untangling a cable. Oh, my God. You know, the simple things. I think Murphy worked in production. <laughs> yeah, he set it rolling. All right, guys. I'm going to stop the live stream. Um, who's this? Steve. Steve, how do you pronounce your last name, Steve? Uh, Frolic. Frolic, how are you doing? Uh, I heard about you got heard about this uh, from Nicole Franco, and um, I've worked with uh, Fran Chris Francis before, so hey, I Steve. wanted to jump on and what's up, man? Sorry to you're see you. Still there? You're still there? Okay. Sorry to see you under these circumstances, but uh, your head looks clean shaven like always, man. Looks great. Hey, fresh shave just for the camera today. Although I ran out of time to put my powder on, so I put Krista closer to the key light. Got it. <laughs> she, has all that. So she has all this hair to soak up, and she's got the backlight, so. Looks great. Your yeah. house is nice. Hey, you know Jody Silly of the Film Consortium? Uh, you know I, yeah, I met her at the San Diego Film Festival. Okay. Last, actually, I think she presented the award, but. Nice. Uh, so oh. I met her on stage. <laughs> you met her on stage. That's a good place to meet her. Uh, yeah. Her roommate's boyfriend lost his taste and smell, and um, mm. he didn't get tested but no one believed him. So this was, this, this was like right when I went down, like that first second week in March. And she was like, yeah, we think he has it. He can't taste anything. So they were like keeping distance and they're still dating, but they weren't touching each other or even being in the same room. But no yeah. one, like no one was believing him. So when I heard, when Nicole sent out the stuff and then I saw you guys, I was like, oh my gosh, that's real. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. Gosh. Probably, probably get tested. Yeah, well, it's, it's, been probably, it's been a while now. He's probably the, in the clear. Get the antibody testing, maybe. At right. least. I, I had a question though. Um, is it okay if I ask a, a, a follow-up yeah. question? Yeah, sure. Yeah, I mean, we're cool. uh, we're off uh, YouTube, so uh, now we can ask. So it's private information yeah. right now. Ask away. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I am recording it, and I will post it later. No. Okay. <laughs> cool. Uh, so, Chris, my question was, uh, what was the feedback from the agents and how was that different from feedback you got from producers? Um, so the main agent that we talked with, he basically told us he was he was great. He was super supportive, but very honest. And he was like, he's like, I don't do anybody favors. He's like, I, I have people, contacts I can call in favors. But he's like, if I don't think what I'm bringing to them is doing them a favor, by bringing them this project, I won't do it. So he told us, he's like, this was back when the film was like 17 minutes long. 
He's like, I think your film is very timely, very interesting, very entertaining. He's like, I think your friends and family will love this, but for a general audience, I need to see more of your struggle. He's like, I need, it can't just be like all, you know, all up. And he's like, he's like, I am, he's like, I'm older. I don't know how old he is. He's probably in his fifties or early sixties or something. He's like, I don't do social media. He's like, so I just kind of assumed that you guys were like influencer people because you, you did an Instagram live in the documentary, which, which was, was the first, first time we've yeah, ever done that. Literally the first time we were figuring out how to do it. Like as we're doing it, we had no idea what we're doing. And he's like, so I just assumed that you guys were like YouTubers or something. And they're just like, he's like, he's like, I don't think it was like, Hey, look at us or blah, blah, blah. But he's like, I think for a general audience, like from traditional distribution, they need to see more of the struggles. Um, he's like, even if your health isn't like, you know, cause I was like, I don't know what we can do. Like mm -hmm. we're not on ventilators. Like I can't like drum this up. And he had some really good feedback of just being like, well, we just want to hear he was basically started naming conversations that we had had off camera about like yeah. financial. What does this look like for us in the future? Or are you scared that it is going to get worse or, you know, kind of, and we're like all these things where we're like, Oh, we, we've, we've talked about that. Right. We just hadn't filmed it. Right. Yeah. So it wasn't like we were making things so up. like building the tension. So like, can you go back and scrub your footage and find moments, even though it's going to end well, you could make it like, a little more stressful. Yeah, we could, there were still like a lot of scenes that we could still film that were still like authentic and real. Like um, there's some conversations we had had that was kind of like, you know, to be honest, like one of my favorite scenes in the film, Krista was just having a bad day that day. And I could feel like she doesn't have a bad day very often. And I could tell that she just wasn't feeling good and just wasn't happy about things. And she was in the kitchen eating some food so I just grabbed the camera and I was like this is gonna piss her off but I'm gonna do it anyways because I think something's gonna come out of this and I was just like you know how are you feeling right now and she just like let I'm like loose. I'm pissed I'm like, yeah. I can't taste anything yeah and just I don't know of, if this is coming back like this is yeah good. and so there were scenes like that that we could we could still film and still be very real and very authentic without like drumming things up mm -hmm. um because I was like I was like just from an integrity standpoint I was like I can't be like how are we going to pay rent? And it's like, well, we're going to pay rent because we've been saving, saving like crazy years. for yeah. five years and getting out of debt and like being respond. You know, I was like, I was telling the agent, I was like, I don't know how you sell that. Cause like most people are like getting laid off and are in like dire straits financially. And for the last five years, we've been the ones that are like, man, this sucks. Like all our friends are buying houses and cars and going on cool vacations. And we're, living in our little one bedroom apartment saving. And then it's like something like this happens and it's like, Oh, we're going to be okay. But it's like, that doesn't make for good TV. Right. So yeah. it was like talking through some of that with him was really helpful to figure out like what could still resonate with audiences. And, um, and so we just kept filming. He was like, I don't think you guys are done. He's like, COVID-19 is not going anywhere. He's like, I don't think you need to rush to like try to be the first person to release something on this. He's like, just keep filming your story, which we did. And our story had a lot more ups and a lot mm -hmm. more downs than we had had to that point. So some of the stuff we did intentional, like intentionally in the sense that like, hey, maybe we should talk about this topic. We haven't talked about it. And then other stuff just happened and we were just capturing it. So, yeah. Cool. Yeah. Uh, was any of the uh, feedback from the producers, did that influence on how you were filming things like technically um no no <laughs> I, I think that that one agent is and he's probably gonna be our best bet at landing a distribution deal i kind of let his feedback be the uh the main and then, i mean one of the other producers in nicole franco who's like yeah. officially come on as my consulting producer so like me and her and one of the editors that i work with a lot and have he has a lot of documentary chops um those have kind of been my main like inner circle. So that's definitely like influenced some of the content and stuff, but um, some of the other stuff, I mean, we've sent it to like a producer that Nicole knows that's like really established and he's just old school. And oh yeah, like, his phone call was funny. <laughs> yeah, his phone call was really funny. After the phone call, I was like, are you, do you still feel okay about yeah. the film? Yeah. Like it was like- Did you mean him? 
no, but Ralph did give us feedback. We okay. just heard back from him like uh, last week, and I, I met him. I met him when he spoke at the Rock. Oh uh, yeah, Mike Mike Diggs, security, got me back. I did nice. the same thing with Jim Caviezel. I rolled up on Mike. I'm like, dude, you gotta let me in there, man. I gotta talk to these guys. <laughs> I got like 15, 20 minutes with him back there before. Nice. Oh, nice. nice. Yeah. Yeah. I've, I've met with Ralph like seven or eight years ago and, and he watched, I don't know if you watched the full cut or just the trailer, but he gave us feedback and was like, this is timely. He's like, I think this is like, this is good. But he was like, I don't have any advice for sales. <laughs> He's like, I don't know. And then his, one of his producing partners got back to us and kind of gave us a couple of like um, channels that he thought might be interested. Um, so yeah, we've got screeners, trailer and screener out to like people that are like, may have, may help us in distribution and other people that are just giving us feedback that are in the industry that have gone through the process themselves to like, let us know what they think. So, yeah. Cool. Well, thanks for what sharing. The guys. Yeah. Part of Great. All this. Good stuff. Cool. Yeah. Thanks. Bob, what was the scariest question? part of uh, your experience? Like, did you ever worry about running for I'm sorry, say that again. You cut out just a little bit. What was the scariest part of your experience? Like, did you ever worry about running in? Oh, we cut out uh, the same part. We, running we, into we what? Keep, you keep, <laughs> we what, keep losing your punchline. What was the scariest part of your experience? Did you ever worry about running out of toilet paper? Uh, <laughs> you know what? I'll say this just because we're like on a private uh, call now. No, not about toilet paper. Okay, no, I didn't know where that was going. Wait, wait, maybe I should stop the recording. I, yeah, I, right. maybe I was thinking about actually posting again. this later. Right. Say, so we, we kind of, we, we don't have TV anyways, so we're not watching a lot of news anyways. That's a good thing. But yeah, so like actually like when we got this, we got this so early, we actually didn't have time to get afraid of it because we didn't have a month or two build up of like, this is going to like murder you uh, type of thing. Um, so I felt fine, but then just like friends and family checking in with us every day, like, are you getting better? Are you getting better? And I, like, and I wasn't like my dumb cough would not go away. Um, and so I'm just like, man, this is like crazy. And then so one night I did get on YouTube on my iPad and freaking, I'm not political at all, but freaking Chris Cuomo on uh, CNN. I don't know who that guy is, but I was like, he scared the crap out of me because like he was doing like his his diary thing where he would like he was because he had it and he was like reporting from home and he's like so I was like oh I want to hear from somebody that has had it and he's like it's you know he was just saying like stuff the like, monster comes at he's night like, the beast it's comes brutal. out at night and it's and, like, brutal and you've got to fight and it was just like these really dramatic like kind of pep talks but he was just like I've got x-rays on my lungs and at night you can just feel it and you got to just fight and I was like I remember in bed just being like oh my gosh is this thing gonna get is this thing gonna get worse and like really starting to get freaked out and i was like i was like okay i just got to turn the news off because like if we didn't know that COVID 19 exists and we had no news like and like krista didn't even take a day off of work granted she was working from home home, but but like yeah um you know we were sick but like luckily we didn't get a severe case but the the fear of that kind of stuff actually like made it way worse and that was was. same the similar like i don't get on the news much or whatever and the one i got on and clicked on some articles and started reading about some random 30 year old that was otherwise healthy like died and whatever and i i started crying and i'm thinking about chris and all this and i was like i need to stop because i don't one we don't have control over it that's been such a good learning experience reminder in this that like we don't have control over what this is and yeah not letting the fear of things that i can't control anyways like yes being aware and we were taking our temperature every single day and you know monitoring how we felt and you know knowing that like okay if we start to feel worse we need to whatever but it was honestly like the fear of what was out there and that's why we chose to avoid it because that's what made us honestly the most scared yeah we're thinking like i mean everybody's experience is so different because then we have to continue to remember that because yeah. like, I talked to a friend who was like really paranoid and kept asking me all these questions and I was kind of like I I think you're gonna be okay and then she was like okay she's like she's like because all my family lives in New York and we've already had like five people die and I'm like oh my gosh like I 
I forgot that like geographically, this is like so different. Like if you live yeah, in New York City, scary, yeah, this yeah. is like legit, like really scary and killing bad. people. And, yeah. But then in San Diego, as of what, a week ago, like, there was six COVID-19 only related deaths in the entire county. Um, I think there was 211 and 109 of those were people in nursing homes and the other like 90 some were like with people with like pretty pre-existing conditions. So it's like pretty wild. Like we have no idea. I don't know. And that's why we've like kept all that stuff out of the film. Cause yeah. we're like, we're the only thing we can tell is our story. Our story. And like, we, we really don't want to try to pretend like we're experts or we know what's going to happen. Cause the whole time we had it, we didn't know. We mm -hmm. didn't know if it was going to get better, if it was going to get worse or if we're going to get it again or, you know, yeah. any of that stuff. So, do you so know what, Mickey Peters? Shocked what was Chris that? that the, I'm shocked you know Chris Mickey that the Peters? media would overblow something like that. Yeah. That's very Eric, say again, I didn't catch that. I said, I'm shocked that the media would hype something and, and scare people. Oh. It's tough. Uh, my wife and I were bouncing back between CNN and MSNBC all the time. I, I peek in on Fox News just to see what they're talking about. And uh, we watch way too much, way, <laughs> way too much. It's back to the cooking shows. Right. <laughs> Do you know Mickey Peters? Uh, I don't think I know that name. She used to do our social media for uh, SDMP. Uh, she, I was talking to her. She's and her husband have recovered. And she was making a comment that she found that her CPAP machine suppressed the cough, which was a big help to her. Oh, interesting. Oh. Huh. That is yeah. interesting. Yeah, it's, it's weird because like, so this is in the documentary, because my cough was like pretty gnarly there for a couple of weeks. Yeah. And Bef before. Yeah, before. And so my doctor actually thought that I had a bacterial infection on top of COVID. So I did a full ran round of antibiotics that did absolutely nothing. Um, so I to think ruin your gut. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I know. And my gut's not good to start out with anyways. But uh, I think it's I mean, it's, I think it's a couple of things because this is what I what I learned the hard way. And it was hard for me to tell Krista this because I was staying up till like 3 a.m. every night editing that I noticed if I got a full night's sleep the next day, my cough was way better. And <laughs> oh, and like sugar. Um, like I'm always I, on about if a I sugar getting, intake. If I, if I was like drinking a chai tea latte or something like the next day I'd be coughing or if I went outside I think allergy season's going on right now so I think my cough is mostly that um it's like 98 percent better now though but um but yeah so, so what was I think uh I think it's time to pull the pin okay that cool. was a great thanks. session um thanks for having us guys yeah no, super you guys thank awesome. you very much yeah nice job Chris Absolutely. Thank, thank you for being on Thank, Thank you for cool. being here. Yes. Thanks for having uh, us, guys. Nice job, Krista. We'll post this up, and we have a follow-up in our newsletter every um, month, so we'll we'll talk about it some more there. And uh, keep us posted if there's any news. Uh, okay. can, uh, you know, we'll we'll at least be directing people to the website and to your cool. Facebook page and so on. Yeah. And there's cool. a link Thank to their website on our on the event page. Great. Cool. There, Thank so. you. And we'll put a link to the trailer we'll on there too. Can in our little part of the world, absolutely. Yeah. Cool. Well, thank you so much for your support. It really, yeah. it really means a lot because I think putting ourselves on camera is a very vulnerable feeling already, and then knowing that it's uh, a pretty hot issue, hot topic that you know, for whatever reason, I'm sure our film there's going to be people that are really against it. So yes. uh, I think like before like Facebook? putting it. Yeah, before putting it out into the public space, it feels really good to know that we have uh, people like yourself supporting us as individuals and also the film, um, because we know we have no idea like if we're going to put this out. I mean, I'll take it as a compliment, I guess, if we put it out in like publication to start ripping it apart. At least they watched it. But uh, anyways, it, I'll stop for handling. It means a lot to us to for your support, and we thank you for inviting mm -hmm. us and having us, and for uh, posting the link and stuff like that. So that means a lot. Absolutely. To us. Yeah. yeah. All right. Thanks, guys. Great. Bye -bye. Thank okay. You very much. Cool. Good night, all. Bye. See you again real Bye. soon. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.